this is where we're at. Uh, this is not something that years ago we preaching that's going to happen in the future. This is now. This is today. Uh, this is uh, 2013. Right here is this verse, and it is in action today. Verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The Bible says, from such, turn away. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God this morning. Lord, help us to rightly divide the word of truth. God, help us to say nothing contrary to thy will. But all that we would say would be to thy glory. Lord, help us, Lord, to take the word of God in all seriousness today, knowing, Father, that we're living in the last days of time. God, let us be bold as Christians, Lord. Let us be bold as lions. Lord, let us, uh, Lord, do in this, in this day, God, as a Christian should do, and stand, Lord, against all the, the, the wiles of the devil, Lord, in thy power, in thy strength. Lord, I pray, God, you'd help us to take a stand in this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. We titled our message this morning, Why We Are In the Shape We're In. And I, I'm telling you, friend, this world is worse than I have ever seen it. I'm not that old yet. I'm getting there, I know. But I'm not that old yet. And I've watched the transformation of our country. You know, in my, in my life, I've watched the transformation in our country from a God-honoring society to a God-despising society. And I know that doesn't cover every, every person in our society, but I look around and I see the way people live and act and I see the way our society has gone and it is not, it is not helpful and it is not a society that it used to be. And there are some things that lead up to that. People wonder why are we in the shape or in why is our country where it's at? Why is it that there's so much sin in our country. Why is it there's so much chaos? Why is it that the, the terrorists are able to act at will? You say we're, we're lucky that it's not. No, it's the grace of God it hadn't happened anymore. But I'll tell you, God's bringing a hand of judgment upon this country, and I'm going to call it what it is. I believe it's the falling of the judging hand of God upon a nation that has turned wicked and disobedient to God. You know what? Nobody's going to say that much anymore. Why? Because it's not politically correct to say that we are a nation that's turning their back on God. We're turning our back on Israel. America has turned its back on God, and God loves us, and God cares for this country, and yet, but He is not going to withhold His hand of judgment upon a nation that will not honor God. Uh, there was a... a a broadcast this morning on the news just for a little bit. A teacher was fired, and I forget where it was at, but a teacher here just recently was fired uh, from their office because a, a, young, a student kept asking a, a question about a verse that he had quoted uh, in, the, you know, in the classroom. It wasn't a teaching lesson or no such, but a, a child had asked for, uh, kept asking him about that question. He said, look, he said, I've got a New Testament that I carry in my pocket. And he showed him the verse. He said, this is mine, but you can have it. And he gave it to that young man if he wanted it. He gave it to him. He took it. So they fired the teacher because he, I thought, you know, what if that had been a Quran that he was handing out? Would he have been fired for that? Probably not. But you know what, my friend? We're, we're a nation that was founded on the principles of this Bible. We hear the... We hear, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but it's all right. I don't follow God. We hear of the statement of separation of church and state. That is not in our Constitution. The government has no right to interfere in our religion, in our Christianity, but that's what it wants to do. They, it's not supposed to make any laws that affect our, our beliefs and our belief system in the Word of God. All our leaders had something you know, had something to say about the Word of God when our nation was founded. Why did we leave? Uh, why did we leave England to start with? It was to get away from the tyranny of those that were 
we're bringing persecution against the, the believers of, the, of then. And where are we at now? We're right back there. I get a little bit disturbed. I'm just going to tell you, I get a little bit disturbed in seeing things that go on the way they are and, and everybody wants to uh, tiptoe around the issues without bringing it all and telling it exactly like it is and what it is. We are a nation of rebellion against God. Why, and we wonder why are we in the shape we're in. Well, number one, we're in the shape we're in because we are living in perilous times. These times, the word perilous, it means difficult, it means dangerous, and it means furious. How many of you this week have had difficulties? It's a difficult time. How many days this week, or, or how, many, how many of you this week have understood that we're living in dangerous times? And how many of you uh, see that we're living in furious times, hateful times, where people hate Christians and will do anything they can to destroy the life of a Christian? Amen. Or just being American puts you on the hit list today. You know, the, the bombing up in Boston, that, you know, that began my thoughts, but I've thought some of these for a long time. Then that fertilizer plant blows up, and I'm not so sure that they won't, you know, never tell us, but that wasn't an act of terrorism. I'll say it. I don't care whether I'm right or wrong. I still, it's in my mind. But let me tell you something, friend. This is dangerous times. I'm kind of a, you know, I'm kind of a, a fellow that, and don't, don't take this wrong, but, but my mind kind of works like, you know, like this, it would be easy for somebody to do such and such, and I'm not going to tell you because it give you ideas, but it'd be easy for somebody to do such and such to, to terrorize this group of people. And I think about those things. And friend, I'm telling you, it doesn't surprise me sometimes when things happen because you can understand that we're living amongst people, or people are living amongst us, a minority of people, by the way, are living amongst us, that want to take over our society and, pro and promote their religious uh, uh, re beliefs on us, and I don't want nothing to do with it. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of them some of it doesn't come from the top down. Amen. Oh, preacher, you're way on a limb. Maybe I am. But I'm telling you what, I know what the Bible says, that we're living in days where it is perilous times and, and uh, the Bible tells us that we as believers are not going to be taken well in this world. We're going to be hated for our beliefs. And you know what? We're there. Amen. We're there. And I, and I say today that those perilous times we're living in are today. And I want to say this by application. The United States is in the shape it's in because, number one, we, in 1962 and 1963, organized prayer and public Bible reading in public schools was deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. There, my friend, is where it all began. There, my friend, is where it all started out was by that boy with... Our Supreme Court made a good decision, did they not? I don't think it was at all a constitutional decision. I think it was, it was a biased decision because they were there. Those were there on the court that didn't want to see our nation go this way. And that's why sometimes the Supreme Court misses it because it's not up to their agenda. And by the way, while I'm talking about that, let me tell you, I don't think you ought to be appointed for a lifetime. Amen. I think they ought to be voted on. Uh, you know, by the by the, the general public or, or some other system put together where they're not sitting there all their life and where a president can't stack the Supreme Court according to his agenda. Amen. Now this is going to get out because I'm not going to borrow Frank from putting it on, uh, on our Facebook page or anywhere he wants to. But you know, I don't much care anymore. It's time that God's people took a stand and told people what's wrong in our country. We're living in perilous times. And our lawmakers, listen, don't get me wrong. I love our country. I, I wouldn't live anywhere else. And that's why I preach like this today because I think it's worth fighting for. I think it's worth standing for. And I think it's worth telling the truth. You say, well, preacher, we're just a little country church in the middle of Madison County. Well, let it be known, thank God, that there's a church in Madison County where they'll know the truth about what's going on in our society. Amen. So we're living in those days. The claim was that 
It violated the separation of church and state. And this, my friend, was brought on by a lawsuit by one atheist, Madeline O'Hare, one person that changed the that changed the entire face of a nation with her lawsuit. And I'm asking today because I was young. Uh, you know, I was only eight years old. By the time I got saved is when all this went on. And I'm, and I'm a thinking and I'm a wondering in my heart, then where were the preachers? Where were the Christians? Where were those to stand up and say, no, we're not going to accept this ruling from the Supreme Court. Where were we? Where were we? Where were God's people? So it passed and it went on. And I understand she changed her whole attitude toward the end and her son disclaimed it all. And I don't know about all of that. I've not studied that deep into it. But I'll tell you something, my friend, today. I know that it did our country a great disservice and a great dishonor when it came to the place where, you see, 30 states. You know, well, no, I'll get there. I'll get there in a few minutes. Just leave that alone. I'll, I'll get there after a while. It, it calls that these, that these be taken out and not be, not be a, you know, it's not disallowed. I understand if, if a teacher wants to teach it as a curriculum that they can teach that if they want to as long as they're teaching all, every other ungodly theory that goes with it. But I'm telling you, friend, the Bible has been outlawed in our schools no matter what the law says. It's been outlawed. Now, I didn't have time, but I was, I, I was going to call a particular school in the Asheville area and ask them if I could come out down there and hand out Bibles and just see what kind of reaction I could get. I'll tell you next week because I'll get them next week and I'll find out. I'm just going to see what they would say. I just, I just want to answer. I just want somebody. And I'm going to call one to Madison County and see what they'll say. I just want to see what they'll say. Amen. I'm fired up. I'm just telling you, I'm fired up. I'm furious. I'm angry today because we've laid down and let the world take over us. Instead of honoring God, we begin to honor the world and the world system by allowing this to take place in our public schools. Listen here now. Before, before this law took place, what do you think the number one issues in school were? I'm going to give you a list. The number one issues in school before Bible reading and before prayer was taken. Listen, I'm young enough to remember when we'd stand up and pledge allegiance to the flag every morning before we started class and the teacher would read a Bible verse from the King James Bible, by the way, and we would have a word of prayer before class started. I remember that. It's not been that long ago, my friend. And guess what? The, 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 before all of that happened, guess what the number one problems in school were by, according to the teacher's survey? Number one, or in not in order, but these are the things. The most common offenses in schools were talking in class, chewing gum, making noises, running in the hallways, cutting in line at lunch, improper clothing, and not throwing away the trash. Now they've still got all those problems. But since then until now, here are what the number one issues are in public schools in our society today. Granted, it's worse in some places than it is other, but I'm telling you it's all because of the fact that in 1962 and 1963, we said that it was wrong for prayer and Bible reading to be held in, in, in public classrooms, and now here's where we're at. The number of the causes that, that teachers face, the things that teachers face today in their classrooms are these. According, uh, you know, along with everything else I just told you, rape, robbery, assault, burglary, arson, bombing, suicide, vandalism, extortion, drugs, alcohol, gang violence, teen pregnancies, abortions, and sexually transmitted diseases. You say, that don't go on much around here. No, but it goes on to a degree. You say, we've not had no bombings in our class. Don't hold your breath, friend. It's liable to happen. I'm telling you, say, now, preacher, don't let, hey, listen, don't live in a cocoon, friend. Don't live in a shell. You've got to understand and you've got to know 
that we're living in perilous times and we need as Christians to be stronger than ever before and we need to name the name of Christ every opportunity we get and we need to stand for what we know is right whether or not it brings persecution upon us or persecution upon our church or whatever the reason, we need to stand for Christ as never before in these last days that we live in. We might have some impact upon our local surroundings if we do. Our nation, because of the word of God, our nation is a nation that was founded on the principles of God's word. Since it has been banned, since the word of God has been, uh, you know, banned from schools, which, I, you know, they tell, still tell me you can take a Bible to school, and, and, uh, but you can't lead a public prayer and these things, and, and it's, it gets to be so gray and messed up to me, I don't understand it all. But I know what God ain't welcome. So since that has happened, it has affected the home. Now I remember as a child when I was growing up, it was far in, far in between where you heard of somebody getting a divorce. Few and far between. But today, listen to this. Six out of ten marriages that occur today end in divorce. Six out of ten. That's 60% anywhere you look at it end in divorce. And that is, that is a statistical, I can't say that word ever. That word, it is that word, statistical evidence that that is by, by records, that's what. Guess why people, guess why it ain't higher than that? Because shacking up. Y'all know y'all heard that before. We call it cohabitating co because of political correctness. But when I was growing up, it's shacking up. When a, you know what that is? When a man and a woman live together and they have sexual relations together before they're married and they just move in one with another. That's what shacking up is. That's what cohabitation is. That is up 350%. Now don't tell me it, may, it didn't make a difference when we quit reading the Bible and praying in school because all of that is in the Word of God. And whether or not that was covered in the Bible reading in school, you know it caused parents to read it more and it caused students to read it more. And these things are not objected to anymore by our society. And matter of fact, it's nothing to hear somebody say, well, we're living together to see if it works. No wonder they can't be happy together. Amen. Well, why are we in the mess we're in? Why do we even need to ask why we're in the mess we're in? And guess what else is up? Adultery. You know what adultery is? Do I have to spell it out for you? That's when a man and a wife have been married and then the man or the wife decides they're going out and they're going to have an affair with another man or another woman and that could be either way also. That is adultery in a marriage. And if anyone's guilty of that, I'll say, shame on you. You need to get right with God. Amen. It's at 300%. 300 percent since 1963, adultery is up. How many of you have heard on the job where this and this or that one's fooling around on their husband and wife? Yeah. Hey, it's all over everywhere. It ain't news anymore, friend. And you know what? It's got to the point where where people don't care a whole lot anymore because they don't know what a true marriage is before God anyhow, and they don't know what it is to be a man and woman that are joined together in, in holy matrimony, truly in love one with another, and, and not to have affections for another one because they, they've never seen that. A lot of them have never seen that in their own home, in their own life, and everybody else is doing it, so it's easy to go with the flow. God help us. Why do we mask why we're in the shape we're in? When adultery is up 300%. George Washington said this, Religion and morality are the essential pillars of a civil society. George Washington said that. You know who that was? President of the United States, first one. And that's what he had to say about it, that religion and morality are the essential pillars of a civil society. Thomas Jefferson said this about marriage, harmony in marriage in the marriage state is the first object to be aimed at. Harmony in the marriage state. And now you've got all kinds of TV programs that, that promote sexual impurity, and I'll get to that in a minute. 
You've got all kinds of programs that, you know, that support fornication. By the way, if I need to spell that out, amen, I'll tell you what that is. That's when a man and a woman have sexual relationships and they ain't married. Amen. If you're doing it, shame on you, guilty. Amen. Get your heart right with God. Amen. You say, well, preacher, everybody's doing that. Yeah, well, if everybody's going out and jumping off bridges, which happened this last week, you're going to follow them and do that too? Listen, friend, we have been, we have been seduced by the one-eyed monster in our living room. We have been taught and trained, and our children have been taught and trained by that television, which I've got one in my house, so I'm not... You know, I'm not preaching against it, but it ain't much to watch anymore, but I got one. And parents allow their, te their teenage kids to sit and watch just anything on the television and not say, well, that's wrong, and not turn it off with that off button and say, well, they're going to learn it anyway, so we might as well just let them learn it at the house. Hogwash, they get enough anyway. Somebody says, preacher, move on. You ain't going to like his next one, so I better stay right here for a little bit. Amen. But should we even ask why we are in the state we're in in our country? Are y'all with me this morning? Number two, we're in the shape we're in because we're a nation of murderers. Now, I'll say this right at the offset. In this crowd, there could be, I don't know, I don't know, I don't think so, but there could be someone that's been caught up in this very thing. If you've gotten it right with you and the Lord, amen, thank God for you, go ahead and serve God. But we as a nation have become a nation of murderers. Now this is where it's going to get a little bit graphic, okay, because i got some statistics to back up what I'm saying. There is now a trial going on in the United States of America up north where a doctor has been, has been put on trial for child murder. He is an abortion doctor who is a devil, is all he is, is full of the devil. He is full of hell. And what he has done has been, he has been one of these doctors that would perform late, uh, late term abortions. And uh, you know what those are. And I'm telling you, listen, here's what happens. Those babies are partially born. And before they can be totally born, they are killed and they are murdered while they are very viable baby. Not a fetus. They are a baby. Now that's been... You know, that's been somewhat banned. But guess what? Your president of the United States ain't against that. I'll tell you, he's not. Hello? Did you hear me? He ain't against it. He won't come out and say he's against it. There's a lot of things he won't say he's against. Shame on him. Shame on our president. I'm angry. I'll tell you. I'm angry. I'm upset. <coughs> Since 1900, a murder, abortion, so you'll know what I'm talking about, was illegal in 30 states and 20 others except for raised in 30 states in 1900 said it's illegal to kill a baby. It's illegal to have an abortion and kill a baby. 30 states. 20 states said that it was Illegal to kill a baby to murder except for rape or incest, which is murder too, whatever you think. You, if you, you've got the right to believe that if you want to, but you're, you're guilty if you believe that it's all right to have an abortion because of rape or incest. It's still a baby no matter how you look at it. Amen. Amen, preacher. Now let me tell you something. In 1973, here we go with the Supreme Court again. The Supreme Court invalidated... They didn't legalize abortion. They invalidated laws in, from 19... They in, invalidated these laws that were held in these 30 states. So, in essence, they say, well, it's not up to the states. The Supreme Court's going to tell them that it's all right to have an abortion. Now, that's what was told. It's all right to kill your baby. Now, when is a baby a baby? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you exactly when a baby is a baby. A baby is a baby that from the moment of conception, not a day down the road. For those of people that would like to advocate for the day after pill, the morning after pill, no, nope, that's a baby. From the time of conception on, that baby is alive. 
Y'all with me? That baby is alive. Now, here are some statistics. <clears throat> Today's... God help us. From 1973, when this law was enacted by the Supreme Court or this invalidation of the laws of the, that the Supreme Court have, you want to look at it, since abortion was legalized in all 50 states, from 1973 till 2011, and I don't have the statistics from 2011 to 2013, but you can we'll figure it up here in a minute pretty close, 54,559,615 murders have been committed to, uh, of unborn children in our country. And we say, God... Why are we in the shape we're in? I'm telling you, God does not honor a nation of murderers. And I'm telling you, everyone that's ever performed an abortion or been a part of it, when they stand before God, if they've not gotten that right with God, they're going to be standing guilty, guilty of murder in God's eyes. Amen, because that's what it is. And I claim it today, it is murder, nothing else, nothing less, but it's murder of an unborn child. I had a, I had a family... Uh, that had a that in another church that that had a child and that and they they didn't know what to do. The child was badly deformed and and uh, they asked me. They said, "Preacher, what do we do? What do we do if the doctor says that that we that it's not going to live and that we have to keep it on life support? Or what what do we do when we have to make a decision?" I was. I told him. I said, "You do this. You leave it up to God, and and you won't have to make any decision." So I began to pray with them, Lord, help this family not have to choose themselves what happens to this child. And guess what? That child is alive today. Is it healthy? It's healthy. Is it mentally deficient? Yes, it is. But guess what? God had a reason for that young and being born into this world. Amen. You say, well, what about all these all these little babies that are born with birth defects and with all of these things. God knows what He's doing. It ain't up to a doctor to tell anyone that they need to have that baby murdered or it's not up to a doctor to murder that baby, but it's up to God in heaven, amen, to deal with results of what goes on in a woman's body, amen. You say, well, I believe the woman ought to have the right to choose. You believe the old woman ought to have the right to choose to murder her child? Is that what we're saying? Under God, why in the world are we in the shape we're in? It's because we're in the shape we're in is why we are. The murder of the unborn is one of the most hideous crimes that I can think of. By today's estimates, the figures will go over about 58 million babies that have been murdered in our land, in our country. The number one state, if, no, I'm getting ahead of myself, I ain't going to go there yet either. 79% of Americans today do not support murder of babies, 79%. 95% of pregnant women want to know all the repercussions and all the rest in having, a, in having a baby murdered. My friend, let me ask you something. If nearly 80% of Americans don't believe in it, why are we still allowed to go on? You know why? Because nobody will stand up and tell people that it's wrong, that it's murder, and demand that there be some action taken by our congressmen and by our senators and by our president that someone do away with murder in our society. God help us know what, what is wrong with us as believers. We won't take a stand. God help us to stand up for what's right. Amen. I ain't mad at y'all if you think I am. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just telling you, amen. I'm just preaching to you what God said to preach this morning. One, listen, here's the way this works out. I'll spare you the details of some of this. One baby is murdered every 26 seconds in our country. 137 every hour, 3,304 Baby murders are committed daily. 
23,196 weekly, 100,516 each month, and 1,206,192 every year, and we wonder why is God not blessing our country. Well, let me ask you something. God bless America, land that I love. Hey, we sang that song when I was a kid, but can we really sing that today? I wish God would bless America, but can he bless our nation when we're, when we're doing all of this right in the face of God and when we're mocking God with all we're doing against the word of God? Can we expect God to bless our nation? The only way God will ever bless our nation is if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then God will hear from heaven and he will heal our land and he'll, he'll, uh, you know, he'll save us and heal our land if we'll do those things. But my friend today, it ain't the world that we're that we preach to today, it's God's people who are called by His name. They're the ones that will bring revival on our country. But guess what? How many of God's people do exist anymore? I'm serious. I see people.